I said, good morning, First Congregational. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Why can't we be glad? We, we can be glad because we serve a God who has formed us, who has shaped us, who has created us, who's knit us together in our mother's womb. And we can be thankful and praise on this Sunday morning because we know that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made for such a time as this. Let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious God, we acknowledge that your spirit is here among us. Open our hearts, open our ears so that we may hear and feel you, O God. Continue to equip us with what we need to go out and serve in this present age. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If all uh, could stand for the opening hymn, How a Firm Foundation, number 266, if you're physically able.
turn to page three in your bulletin. We'll read the litany. As we look back along the pathway of our past, we see the present in your faithfulness, O oh God. God has led us through years of pain and struggle, and the way of peace remains our guiding precepts. God will guide us in the ways of right righteousness for one another. God weeps for us in our ignorance and prays for us to learn the things which bring peace to all people. God has forgiven our follies so that we might know the love that is in Christ Jesus. We shall eat the bread of mercy and drink the cup of grace. We seek to show forth God's presence in all of our ways. Go forth then, you redeem you redeemed of the Creator. Serves God daily through the holy covenant, God's will shall reign forever. We shall trust God's spirit.
Let us pray. Most merciful Father, as we lift this offering up to you, we again freely acknowledge that you are the owner and we, have, we are but the custodians of all that you have entrusted to us. For the opportunity to demonstrate to you that we will do what you have asked us to do, we thank you for this offering. We pray that you teach us to magnify and extend its reach in this place and in this community, that it might be a blessing to others. These and all the blessings we ask in the precious name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Beloved, we come together now to prepare ourselves for prayer. And whether you are old or young, rich or poor, everybody needs prayer. I'm reminded of that song that I like, Somebody Prayed For Me. And I'm so glad that even when I wasn't praying, somebody was praying for me. There is much to pray about in this broken world. There is much to lift up to God. Not only our personal concerns, but also our corporate concerns, our collective concerns. I want you to add to your prayer list the family of Aretha Franklin. My dear sister homegirl from Detroit, we set our clock on Aretha Franklin. And I was just in Detroit at the very church where she will be funeralized next week, at Greater Grace. But the whole city is lifting her up in prayer and in gratitude. Pray for the family in the days that lie ahead. You know, death can be a traumatic moment in families. I also want you to pray for the family of Senator John McCain doesn't matter what your politics are. He was a man of personal integrity at a time when we don't have enough people of personal integrity. He was big enough to say when he was wrong. He was big enough to dispel some of the lies that would have befallen even his opponents. That takes courage. It takes a person who has priorities in his life. Pray for that family. They are grieving. It's been through a long battle. But I'm amazed by the triumphant spirit that allowed him to overcome all of the things that he overcame and never complained. We hope that our leadership will take a cue from John McCain. I don't know that the leadership will, but I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray that the leadership will take a cue. Also, I want to pray for someone who you don't know. His name is George Walker. And George Walker was a mentor of mine. He was the first African-American composer to win a Pulitzer Prize in music. And he died two days ago at the age of 96. And one of my proudest moments was when we honored George Walker here at the National Black Arts Festival because many people didn't even know who George Walker was. He's a great man, and we pray for his family. There are a lot of people to pray about. Chip has lost an aunt, and we want to pray about Mary Sellers. We want to pray for all of those that are grieving, all of those that need lifting up. And we pray for ourselves, because whatever it is, God can fix it. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we know you are able. We know that you have all the power, all the knowledge. We know that you see all things, control all things. 
we also know that you are a loving and awesome God. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Some of these prayers, Lord, you've heard before, but we just keep on praying because we keep on knowing that you hear our prayers and you continue to speak to us and to our hearts. We pray, Lord, for those who have forgotten how to pray. We pray for those who don't know you and your power and your grace. We pray for all of those who are broken and bruised in this world and ask, Lord, that at this very moment as we pray, you might reach out and touch them and give them your peace, your peace. We pray, Lord, for a world that continues to be fractured by greed and avarice, for a world, Lord, in which the downtrodden seem to continue to be downtrodden, and the greed and the pride and the egos of those on the top of the heap would direct the world by their standards and not by yours. We pray for the greedy and the people that we don't like or agree with, that they might be open to your will as we must be open to your will. We pray for our nation, which has lost its way. We pray, Lord, that you might shine a little light right now on all of us who need it. And Lord, we're not above knowing that we need that light to shine in on our lives. As disappointed as we are in our leaders, we know, Lord, that we are also leaders and also have a ministry. Shine a little light on us today that we might leave this place and make the world a little brighter. For our sick and shut in who wish they could come to church, for those that are in hospital rooms this very morning, for the physicians and the caretakers who must do the healing that you've empowered them to do, Lord, be with us all. And Lord, in spite of our trials, remind us of the many triumphs that you have given and provided us. Remind us that we are more than victors through Christ who lived and died and was resurrected for us. Remind us, Lord, to take care of ourselves because this journey is not yet over and we must be strong and up to the task. Enable us, Lord, to be your hands and feet. Use us in every way and help us, Lord, as we serve to serve with joy and with gladness because you are the God we love and serve. Keep us ever mindful of Jesus, Lord, who walked this way. Keep us ever mindful of the prayer he taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the kingdom.
New Testament is taken from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads of the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah, and his sons, Abraham and Naor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before all of us, all of the peoples, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and put in the strength of his power, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Watch God change things. Amen. Let's hear it for both of our choirs who have just done <clears throat> such a wonderful job, such a wonderful job. In some ways, they helped the preacher in the preaching task by preparing us so well. I thank both choirs and all of the leadership and for all of you for what you do. Thank you. It makes a big difference. You know, preaching is like playing a jazz saxophone solo. Just before the solo moment that I'm supposed to pick up my horn and play behind some great musician, I get a little nervous. And I've done all my practice and my preparation. I've learned the tune and the changes, and I've listened to all the great solos. But there is that moment just before it's my turn that I want to just go right out the door. And I just had that moment about two minutes ago where I said, Lord, let me just go out for a pack of cigarettes and come back. But they say, unless you get a little bit nervous about preaching, you are a fool if you don't get nervous. That you are out of your mind if you do not take seriously the folly of preaching, trying to shed God's word. Well, I'm not going to go out the door. I'm going to stay with you for just a little bit. But I want to speak on the subject, subject of dress for spiritual success. Dress for spiritual success. My dear friend Joyce Edwards introduced me to the Dress for Success program many, many years ago. It was one of her many volunteer efforts. It is now a worldwide organization. In over 30 different countries and 150 cities, the Dress for Success program helps women to toward socioeconomic uplift and self-sufficiency by providing them with the proper attire to go out into the work world. This is important work. They provide not only the clothes, the exterior, but they provide also the support for women that women might get a good opportunity in the workplace. Dress for success. Joyce, you introduced that to me. And as I was preparing this this message for today and as I was reading the lectionary and as I looked at the descriptions in Ephesians, I said what Paul is doing is he's des describing literally how you're supposed to be dressed for spiritual success. And as I went through his litany of the descriptions of the de different pieces of garments, the belt, the helmet, the shoes, I said, what Paul is trying to tell us about is dressing for spiritual success. And then I thought about it a little bit more, and I said, you know, we judge people oftentimes by how they are dressed. A lot of times we adorn ourselves so that people might know who we are by how we're dressed. And just the way we're dressed sometimes helps us to kind of frame, oh, I know who that person is, because they have on a Givenchy or, uh, you know, uh, a Brooks Brothers, uh, uh, this kind of shoe or that kind of shoe. We look at people on the exterior, don't we? And we do judge. We do judge. And sometimes if a person has been on the down and out, when we see a person like on the stoop of the church early on the morning where they've been sleeping on the step of the church, and they will invariably put on the clothes or keep on the clothes that they had the day before and the day before and the day before. We think about who that person is simply because of the way they are dressed. 
we don't oftentimes consider that the way they are dressed is not because of their choosing, but because of life's choosing. Yet and still, we do put value on them, don't we? We do think that there must be something wrong with them. They don't have a place to stay. They must have something wrong with them. They're in these dirty, filthy clothes, and I don't want to get too close because I don't want to get their filth on me. How they are dressed, we judge. And we don't ask, who's the person behind the dress? Just like when we see somebody dress up really nice, we don't ask, who's the person behind the good dress? And I want to suggest to you that sometimes a person with a nice suit on or with some expensive shoes on doesn't necessarily tell you that much about who they are on the inside. In fact, I'm beginning to think that some people dress on the outside so they can fool you and not let you know who they really are on the inside. They, they, they are dressing for a kind of success that is the success to make you think this is not who I really am. I want you to see my suit. I want you to see my tie and my shoes. And I'll never forget when I first came to First Church and I preached uh, for Reverend George and Lord have mercy, I had on some brown shoes. And I didn't know that brown shoes was outlawed in First Church. <laughs> But the dear sister who came and corrected me, God bless her, and she will remain nameless. But she said, Reverend Andrews, we don't wear brown shoes in the pulpit. And that was a, that was a course correction. I'm old enough now, I wear any kind of shoes I want. But in those days, that corrective was very, very powerful. She didn't even hear my sermon. She obsessed on my brown shoes. And so it just reminded me that in spite of what I may think or want to think, people do judge a book by its cover. They do judge people by what they have on or don't have on. And so today I wanted to put it on a different platform because Paul has given us in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, he's given us directions for how to dress for spiritual success. Paul, remember, is in prison when he's writing this letter. He's not well-dressed and writing from his office in Rome. He is in jail. Yet and still he writes this word of encouragement to people that they might be armed for what is needed for spiritual success. He probably is looking like one of these homeless people out here. His clothes are tattered. He's not doing well on the outside, but he has the spiritual insight to write a word of encouragement to those who would come after. He tells you about the different kinds of things that you might want to arm yourself with in order to do, as the scripture says, spiritual battle. And so he's not talking about armaments in the way in which we think of when you're getting ready to go into a war, you need what? You need offensive weapons. But he describes the kind of armor that protects you, that you might be able to give a spiritual message. In other words, when he talks about the breastplate, that's a breastplate of righteousness that's protecting you. It's not an offensive weapon, it's holding you close that you might be able to remain fit for the battle, to, to gird your waist with a belt of truth. That means that the lie can't come in because you're already girded. Your loins are girded with the truth. It's not an offensive weapon in the sense that it's not destroying anything. It's preserving what needs to be preserved. Beloved, the truth needs to be preserved. I've heard so much ridiculous stuff about the truth, I almost don't know if I know what the truth is. I've heard people in high places say the truth is not the truth. The facts are not the facts. It depends on how you look at what, well, it doesn't depend on how you look at it. The truth be the what? The truth. And so Paul is anticipating what we regard as a kind of worldly war, but he's talking about the powers of evil, a spiritual war, in what you will have to be armed to defend against the evil ones, plural, because the scripture says they are many. So don't just think about one little energy. 
I'm trying to, trying to keep it correct. But there are a lot of evildoers in the world because evil is bigger than we want to think. And Paul is saying that you have to be spiritually dressed for the battle. You have to be armed with shoes that will allow you to take you there. Oh, Lord. I don't really need this, but just in case. Paul is telling us that it don't matter what the papers say. The truth is the truth. See, I can flip it. Can I flip it? I, 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 I wanted to do it that way so that I could, so that I could point out that I'm not dependent on the, on the words on the paper. I'm dependent on the word of God. And all of a sudden, I'm armed and equipped. I can go anywhere because I got the right outfit on. I got the, the right spiritual equipment. So when you go through this litany of descriptions that he gives you, he's helping you to know what you need to have all about you so that you can be armed for the spiritual battle. You know, sometimes I think when we get so upset about what's going on in the world, we forget that there is a spiritual war afoot. And that all of these worldly manifestations are something much deeper and much more profound. Evil is profound and it's real. But while we're worried about this person or that person, you need to worry about the evil of which that person is a manifestation. Or these people are manifestations. Paul was trying to keep us with our eyes focused on the spiritual war that is being waged. And so he's not trying to tell us about get a bigger gun or a bigger knife. He's saying you need to be armed with the sword of truth, the belt of truth, the helmet of what? Salvation. See, when you put the salvation on top and when you got some, some spiritual shoes on the bottom, you can change things. And that's what he's encouraging us to do. So when you, when you go home tonight... Take a look at that passage again. We read it and we look at all the metaphors, but we don't think about the power of somebody who is in prison, but who knows the power of God and sends a word of encouragement from prison. Martin Luther King wrote a letter from prison. That letter changed the world. I think Martin himself probably had a revelation because you know when, when they shut the cell door, there's something happens when that sound. I've been in jail before, and I know not because I was convicted, but I was visiting. But <laughs> but seriously, when I visited the jail. And that, that, that door slammed shut. It's terrifying. It's a terrifying sound. And, and, and so when Martin had some time to think and to meditate in jail, he wrote a letter from a Birmingham jail. And that letter helped to transform all of us who are on the outside. Sometimes power comes when you're at your lowest point. When you're at your point of deepest despair, that's when the epiphany comes. And so all of a sudden, the, the prisoner, the one who we think that we have disempowered, all of a sudden becomes an empowering agent yeah. for change. Yeah. Empowering you not for some kind of war in the physical sense, but in a spiritual sense, because don't you know that it all comes from spirit? Justice is a spiritual expression. Righteousness, that's a spiritual expression. It's not political. It, it, it's spiritual. It comes from the grace of God. Truth is not a sense of facts. It's the truth that comes from the word of God. And the word of God doesn't move, doesn't change. It empowers. It enables that is the very agent to fight the evil that would befall us. We are in perilous times. Uh, there hasn't been a time that I can remember quite like this. But beloved, now is a time much like 
much like Paul, we need to think of ourselves as we need to write a letter from prison to say that we will not be kept in these chains, but we will free the world because we know the truth. To me, that's very, very powerful. When I think about all of the young black men that are in jail, who've lost the sense of being empowered, when I think about the, the system of justice that de-empowers the humanity of the people who have been put in jail, that's, that's not justice. That's, that's retribution. That's retribution with hatred and racism all piled into one. And that's a bad sandwich. But when we think about it, we can think about the fact that that's why Paul is writing us and telling us you need to go into the prison to free the captives. That's why if you're going to be a slave, be a slave to Christ, not to the world. So I want us to dress for spiritual success. I want us to be armed with the truth, with the word of God, with the helmet of salvation, with, with shoes that will allow us to go in all of those places that we don't want to go, but that God will empower us to walk into. You know, in the ancient times, the shoes were the most valuable piece of your garb you had because if your feet weren't working, you weren't working and you couldn't go anywhere. And that's why in scripture, it's so important to take care of your feet and your foot coverings because you need those in order to live. Beloved, we need to spend a little bit less time styling and a little bit more time serving with the spiritual garb that God has given us. Frankly, as dark as this moment is, I'm being encouraged because there are examples of light here and there and here and there. And the opportunity is for us now to get dressed, get all dressed up, but not for each other, for God spiritually dressed for success. Amen. Amen. The message of the song is clear. Right now, today, just come. Come to Christ. We open the doors of the church and extend an invitation to all of you to Christian fellowship, not to join the church, but to join Christ in Christ's mission. 
Everybody needs a community of faith to live in. That's what Christianity is. It's a faith of people who come together in what? Communion. So if this is your day to join us, I want you to come down and stand with us. We are a church. We are not perfect people, but God is working with us as a community of faith. If you're looking for a church home and want to be a part of this great fellowship, come down and stand with me. And I'm going to invite the congregation to just stand at this very same time that we might give someone some courage to come on down and join us in fellowship. standing for our service of silence. We want to say to all who have visited here today, we want you to know you are always welcome. This is an open door community. We want you to step on in. I'm going to ask my friend Reverend Palmore to come that he might give us the benediction as this lovely acolyte comes to take the light back out into the world. We also want to acknowledge uh, the battles. Michael, it's great to see you. You're one of my heroes and one of the great teachers and pastors. Also, <laughs> my student who is now a pastor himself, Brother Carl, so good to see you. I'm glad to have you here. Wonderful. Jean, would you come and give us the benediction? You already ready? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm reminded of um, something I heard years ago when you speak of the truth. And it's, there's a difference between a good answer and the truth. Because even a broke clock is right twice a day. And so we must always understand that the truth never lies. The truth stands on its own. The truth doesn't need help. And it doesn't need an alibi. And it certainly doesn't need us to verify it. It just needs us to stand in it. Please repeat after me. I must live with myself. I must live with myself. And so, and so I want to be fit. I want to be fit for myself to know. For myself to know. I don't want to come to the setting sun. I don't want to come to the second sun. Hating myself. Hating myself. For the things I have done. For the things I have done. So what would Jesus have us to do? He would have us to put on the armor of truth. I call it Jesus wear. Put on the armor of truth, walk in truth, live in truth, love in truth. And when you do all of these things, God will be with you. So go forth with a joyful amen. Go forth with the spirit of God, knowing that whatever you do, do it with love, do it with peace, and give all honor to God. May God bless you and keep you for the living of these days.